So, um, hello everyone. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, Remy for the kind invitation to speak in this workshop, which has been really great. And I, I want to apologize that I missed the, the session this morning, but I had a, a scheduling conflict with an important meeting I needed to attend to. So I was just giving another talk from here uh, 20 minutes ago uh, for one of uh, uh, our technology projects. So today I'm going to, oh, uh, also I'm, I'm now at Maastricht University in the Netherlands, uh, not anymore at the University of Geneva, as is mentioned in the program. Um, <laughs> no problem. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, energy efficient information transfer in brain circuits. And um, so I'm a, I'm a cellular neuroscientist, I guess. Um, and I want to start with uh, two, by making uh, two points, um, uh, one of which is, uh, might seem a, a bit uh, uh, unrelated, but I will try to convince you that it is. So the first thing that I want to uh, highlight is that the brain is incredibly heterogeneous. Uh, not only different brain regions are different, but also uh, a lot of people tend to think of um, the brain as a neural network. And I would like to argue that this is uh, the wrong way to think about it. And, and to illustrate that point, um, uh, I'd like to show a slide from, from this paper by Azevedo and, and colleagues, uh, where they, it's basically a computational uh, neuroanatomy paper where they looked at various human brains um, and, and they looked at the, different, the composition of cells in these different brain regions. So if you look at the whole brain, you can see here that apparently we have uh, about 90 billion cell, <laughs> okay. <laughs> you think it's already there, it's chat GPT is taking its revenge. Yeah, so apparently we have about 180 billion cells, half of which are neurons and the other half are not neurons. Uh, but in fact, most of the neurons, they are in your cerebellum, uh, somewhere at the back of your brain. And a lot of them are tiny neurons that don't look very fancy at all, uh, like granule cells. And in the cortex where we think uh, all the cool stuff is happening, you will see that there's <laughs> actually a vast majority of the cells in the cortex are not neurons. So we have about 60, what is it? Uh, okay, 16 billion neurons in the cortex um, uh, versus uh, 60 billion uh, non-neuronal cells. Um, and this is what uh, happens in the rest of the brain. So what are these non-neuronal cells? So this is a really old cartoon from the, I think from the 90s. Um, it's actually, uh, they are collectively called uh, glial cells. Um, uh, glial cells is actually an umbrella terminology because there's a different subcategories. There are astrocytes that you can see here wrapping up synapses and contacting blood vessels, uh, oligodendrocytes that form the myelin sheath, which allows for fast uh, conduction of action potentials, and uh, the, new, the new frontier cells that everyone is uh, really hyped about, microglia, which are the resident uh, brain immune cells. And this is just, uh, this is actually pretty old. I think that today you would have some uh, additional categories that would fall under this uh, glia terminology. Um, and if you look at the brain structure um, in detail, so this is a, a 3D reconstruction from a, a cortical column. Uh, you can see that uh, it's a, it's really, it's a mess. Uh, so you have, uh, these are, the different colors are from different of cell types. And, and um, you can appreciate that it's a very compact tissue with a lot of things uh, interconnecting with each other. And this is not even including the vasculature. This is from the same paper. Uh, well it's a 3D construction of the vasculature in an equivalent column in a rodent. And yeah, your brain is basically full of uh, blood vessels that deliver glucose and oxygen and many other things. And if you zoom in onto uh, the tissue, this is sort of an artist uh, reconstruction of, of one of these pieces of tissue. Uh, here we have uh, dendrites or pieces of neurons in yellow, vessels in red, and these astrocytes I was mentioning earlier uh, in blue. And you can appreciate, okay, this is not uh, the whole, uh, it's actually uh, uh, a lot of cells are not represented to allow some kind of visualization. So I think it's only 10% of the neurons that are represented here. Um, and yeah, so, so you can appreciate that this is like a really a messy structure with a lot of different uh, components of different uh, cell categories that uh, interpenetrate with each other and, and that make these uh, this, uh, uh, beautiful brains. And these cells for a very long time, they have been, um, glial cells for a very long time, they have been uh, disregarded. Uh, people thought that's where the, the terminology is coming from actually, that they were just there to glue the neurons together and they were like <laughs> some kind of a structuring element. 
Um, but a lot of these VL cells, they have very interesting properties. Um, um, I just wanna, so this is a, a immune cell, a microglia. You can see that uh, this is from a, a paper we published a few years ago. It's actually, uh, this is image with a two photon microscope in the, in the rat brain. Um, and you can see the cell body here, it's extending processes and scanning mechanically or physically scanning its environment all the time. And if you nuke a neuron here with the laser, you will see that all these guys are extending all of a sudden their processes to uh, converging on the damaged area to try to contain uh, the damage. Um, so these cells, they, do, they seem to be doing some interesting things. This is an astrocyte. They are not electrically active, although now even that, that is being uh, questioned. Uh, this is calcium imaging from Balzit Kak's lab. Um, and, and you can see that, the, I mean, it's blinking everywhere. There's, so there's a lot of things happening in these cells that we, we don't really understand uh, uh, what it is um, and what they are good for. Although there is now accumulating evidence that all these mechanisms play a role in, in physiology, but also in pathophysiology, including in information processing. I'm gonna get back to that. And even oligodendrocytes, which I guess for many years they were assumed as being uh, a structuring element that is important uh, in the propagation of action potential. So this is a cartoon neuron and you would have these smiling sheets that covers uh, this axon that allows uh, fast uh, and cheap propagation of uh, ac signals along the, the axon from the cell body to the terminal here. Um, if you look at them, so for a long time, people thought, okay, you know, unless something goes seriously wrong in your brain, um, you, you, you are born or you eventually at some point when your brain reaches maturation, you're stuck with uh, whatever these guys are and that's it. And in fact, um, if you look at the detailed structure now, it's pretty complex. You have a, you have a lot at this, you have these nodes where the myelin sheet is interrupted and with a lot of ion channels that regenerate the electrical signals here. Uh, lots of proteins and stuff. I mean, it's a pretty complex structure. There's also uh, a space that is called periaxonal space between the myelin sheet and the axon, uh, which is a bit weird because it makes the, electrically it makes the axon leaky. So it, ma it makes it less efficient in a way at propagating action potentials. Um, and so recently uh, with some colleagues, we found out that this is actually uh, plastic. And so you can uh, adjust that um, and uh, so I just show here some results of some simulations, but uh, we, we have experimental data that suggests that, that where the, actually the project came from, uh, that you can adjust the, the space that is uh, this empty space that is surrounding the axon uh, below the myelin sheath. And that's actually potentially an elegant mechanism to tune the propagation speed of the, of the action potential. And, and over distances of uh, typically a centimeter, which would be the relevant scale for a rodent brain for uh, intra-hemispheric, uh, inter-hemispheric um, communication, you can uh, speed up or delay the arrival time of an action potential by uh, 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 several milliseconds per centimeter of uh, propagation. And, and that, you know, that would be enough to um, adjust uh, the causality of action potentials, if you think about spike timing dependent plasticity, which is a form of plasticity where uh, the exact arrival time and, and, and uh, generation time of uh, uh, pre and postsynaptic potential is actually important. Uh, this is actually not the first paper that um, where plasticity in these cells has been reported. Uh, there's actually a, a, a paper from 2011 that was published in Science where people showed that there's also a dynamic reorganization of the whole structure here uh, and that displays, this is really important for learning. So if you, if you prevent this dynamic reorganization of the uh, overall structure with new cells being integrated uh, to myelinate axons, you can prevent learning or impair learning of uh, complex motor tasks. Okay, so that was my first point. There's a lot of stuff in the brain. Uh, uh, most of it in the cortex is probably not neurons and the more we look at it, uh, the more we find out that these cells, they are actually pretty important in, in organizing neural networks and but also to an extent maybe uh, shaping the activity in neural networks. And how does this connect to the theme of this workshop, which is energy consumption? Well, astrocytes, uh, uh, so Pierre-Yves Placé was mentioning yesterday that this has been a pretty uh, debated story. So the, but uh, th there's a, the, the main role that astrocytes were initially identified for is metabolic metabolically supporting the activity of neurons. So keep that in mind and I will, I will get back to that uh, afterwards. 
Um, the second point I want to do in the introduction is that the brain is rather expensive. By that I mean uh, energetically expensive. So it's often portrayed as this kind of a really cheap computational device in comparison to, I don't know, chat GPT or, or um, um, other, you know, um, man-made devices that can compute. And people say, okay, it has a, a power uh, of 20 watts, uh, which is much lower. It's like uh, the, the power consumption of a incandescent, an old-fashioned incandescent light bulb. But if you look at this from the, the, body, the, your, the perspective of your body, it's actually a pretty expensive organ. Uh, and this is illustrated here. So this is a, 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 a male who that received, uh, was received the injection of F18 fluorodeoxyglucose. So this is radio labeled so that you can take an image. Uh, glucose is the main substrate for energy production in the brain. That's 99% of energy production in the brain. Uh, so of ATP is derived from glucose. Um, and deoxyglucose makes it so that this thing gets stuck in, in, the, in the glycolysis. And so it accumulates where you have high energy consumption and allows you to check you know, which organs are consuming a lot of energy. And you can see here that the heart is uh, pretty strongly labeled, the brain is very strongly labeled, and also the bladder, but this is only because that's where this thing is evacuated from. So it doesn't indicate high energy consumption in the bladder. And if you, if you um, calculate or measure accurately uh, or roughly, uh, uh, you know, how much energy the brain consumes, you will find out that even though it's only 2% of the body weight, it's responsible for about 20% of the whole body glucose utilization. And this doesn't really change even if you sleep. Uh, it decreases a bit when you sleep, but not that much. So it's, it's a pretty, you know, you, and you can't, you cannot unplug it, which I, th I think is an interesting difference to uh, devices with that you can unplug and they still work when you replug them later. If you unplug the brain, uh, you have a stroke and, and something really bad is going to happen. I, I sometimes I have a gruesome picture of a, a post-stroke brain. I mean, basically you can have entire areas of the brain that are completely gone uh, if, you, if you don't intervene um, uh, when someone has a stroke. So if you disconnect the energy supply to the brain, uh, really bad things happen. Um, and even if you think about uh, <coughs> developmental status or development of the brain, um, so this is a, this is a uh, a graph from this paper by Kuzawa and colleagues. Uh, it's the brain glucose uptake to body's resting metabolic rate. So it's this 20% here, but it's uh, quantified uh, over a developmental age. Uh, and you can see that uh, at around age five, 70% of the uh, baseline metabolism of a kid basically goes towards the brain. Um, it doesn't necessarily indicate high energy consumption for information processing because there's a lot of plastic reorganization of the brain. So there's a lot of a structural reorganization of the tissue, uh, but it tells you, you know, this is not a cheap organ to build and to develop. And in that study, it eventually plateaus down to 19%, uh, so about this 20% I was indicating here. And so neuroscientists for many years, they like to think that energy is for free in the brain. Um, and in fact, uh, there's a seminal paper uh, that uh, was actually uh, written by these two people at UCL uh, who are anthropologists who basically came up with this expensive tissue hypothesis. Uh, in a nutshell, they are arguing that it's the advent of cooking, which makes food uh, easier to digest and to chew, that uh, uh, you know, s uh, saved a lot of energy that can then be used uh, to, to have a more complex brain function. Uh, it's unclear whether there is really a lot of evidence for that, uh, but there is, there is some amusing. So I think yesterday we saw the, the talks from um, uh, uh, Nathalie and Pierre-Yves that I think made a good argument that there is in fact energy uh, uh, constraints on brain function. Uh, but there is uh, these two amusing uh, results that I like to show. Um, so this is again from uh, uh, Fonseca Azevedo and Herculano Hausel. What they did is to basically combine uh, a lot of metabolic and behavioral data uh, from different species. These usually fall along a parallel and you can combine these parallels together. And they come up with this figure here, which is pretty ugly, but I mean, basically what it is is that they estimate what is the uh, uh, acceptable or functional range uh, depending on body mass for primates, depending on uh, body mass and size of the brain. So you can see here, uh, this is uh, increasing number of neurons. Baboons have about 10 billion neurons. And if you wanna metabolically pay for uh, that body mass and, and that brain size. Uh, this is the basically the, the range of uh, areas that are acceptable. So that's the number of hours that you need to spend 
uh, feeding on, on basically leaves and branches if you live only on a raw vegetarian diet. Yeah, so if you, if you don't cook and you only eat leaves in the forest, and this is your body mass and your brain size, this is how many hours you need to spend uh, basically feeding in order to survive. And you can see that it, it gets uh, pretty significant. So gorillas, for instance, they spend eight hours a day or so just feeding. And apparently this, match, this data, they argue in the paper, matches uh, behavioral data. And so we as humans, we are sitting here uh, with our 90 billion neurons or about, so we would have to spend uh, most of the day basically eating on, uh, on a raw vegetarian diet, which wouldn't leave much time to attend workshops. Um, the other thing here, which again, I show it more as a, I'm using fact because y it's the, how much does that connect to really to, uh, to, uh <laughs> to really to brain energy metabolism is an open question. Uh, but this is a really this cool paper from Dan Siger et al. And so what they did, um, so they, they compiled data from uh, Israeli um, proba probation courts where people uh, apply to be uh, released early from jail. Um, and this is the proportion of favorable decision uh, over time. So they do a lot of controls for many things uh, in that paper, but basically what they see is that there are big spikes in the, in the decision making of the judges. Um, you know, you have big spikes uh, after lunch and after tea uh, so, and I think it's called ordinal position because they probably scaled all of these uh, uh, according to the actual time when, the, when this happened uh, across different courts. Uh, but you can see that, uh, yeah, so if you, if you want to exit jail early, you, you better have a lawyer that manages to, to get you uh, early in the morning or immediately after lunch or tea. So there's a suggestion there that maybe uh, the glucose level in your bloodstream changes uh, the way you behave and the decisions that you make. Okay, so I mentioned these two facts. So there's a lot of stuff in the brain. Uh, not all of it are nerves. Um, also the brain are, are, is a very expensive organ with very high baseline energy metabolism. And so I will, I will try to argue that uh, these things are linked to each other uh, and that they can help us understand certain aspects of brain computation. And maybe if I have time at the end, I will try to convince you that there are some cool technologies that can be developed based on some of the understanding or approaches uh, that, that, we are, that we have. Okay, so the brain is expensive. So where is this uh, energy being consumed? Uh, so there are several people who have done that exercise to try to uh, figure out. So there are different ways to do that. One way is to basically build up an energy budget from the bottom. So you basically look at all the processes that you know about that consume ATP in the brain. You try to estimate uh, how, at what rate they run, and you make a big boring accounting list of, of where energy is being spent. And there's a good reason to think that a lot of it is being spent at synapses. So this is just like a, a cartoon from, from this paper uh, where we looked at the different processes that consume ATP uh, at synapses. And that basically what happens is that when a neurotransmitter is being released, uh, let's say glutamate, it will activate uh, some receptors on the postsynaptic terminal. Uh, this leads to transmembrane currents and you upset the ion balance uh, between the inside and the outside of the, of the cell. And mostly that leads to accumulation of sodium inside the cell and the cell wants to keep the sodium concentration low. So it activates this pump here, uh, which basically exchanges sodium and potassium versus uh, uh, one ATP molecule. And that's the, that's the pump that is responsible for most of the energy consumption in the brain. I mean, this has been shown in various experiments. You can block it, but bad things happen when you block it because it really upsets the ion balance uh, there. And, and so that's where eventually most of the energy is being consumed. So if you, if you try to do an estimation of that, you can see that activation of, this recep uh, of these postsynaptic receptors Will, will lead to a, a massive amount of uh, ATP being consumed. And if you quantify that further, you get to these kind of pie charts where essentially um, about 60%, you conclude that about 60% of energy is expended at synaptic connections. And it's mostly to pay for the ionic currents that, that activate the postsynaptic terminals. Uh, and there's some recycling of molecules and whatnot that add to that but maintaining the resting potential of neurons and, and paying for the action potential, which is the actual signal that is sent out, is relatively cheap. Uh, this is obviously to be taken with a, a grain of salt. 
uh, for two reasons. First of all, because when you do this kind of accounting, I mean, you, you put in the model what you think you know about the physiology, and obviously, uh, you know, there might, there might be adjustment to that thing uh, down the line. But also, you can try to do experiments about that, but it's pretty hard because the pharmacology, we've done that, but the pharmacology is pretty messy, so you, you don't really, it's hard to get uh, hard numbers and precise numbers to, 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 to estimate this. So now I want to just point out this connection here. So on the right, you have one of these astrocytes, and they are really important in synaptic communication because they are responsible for siphoning the glutamate that is uh, released here away from the synapse. And this really matters because if you leave, the glutamate is the excitatory signal, and if you leave it here, it will just keep activating the synapse over and over again. And, and so you have this uh, uh, glutamate excitotoxicity that can occur. So it's important also for, for the timeliness of the signal that there's a mechanism to get rid of this glutamate so that you, you terminate the, the signaling. Um, so you can already imagine that it's, it's not such a, uh, a hard sell to, it shouldn't be too much of a hard sell to convince you that how this process is regulated is actually pretty important with regard to a, a precise signaling in the brain. And this also involves, so this glutamate is eventually recycled and sent back to the neuron, and this al also involves uh, an accumulation of sodium inside the astrocyte, which means, um, you know, you have the, the same kind of uh, signaling that is involved here. Um, okay, so how does, does that connect or relate to information transfer? Well, um, so synapses are expensive, but they are not particularly reliable. So if you were to design them, you would definitely not build them like this, at least not if you are, I guess, an engineer. And, and why is that? Is because when you send an action potential down the axon, um, it leads to the release of uh, neurotransmitters here, but it's a really stochastic process and it can be shockingly low. So if you look at, uh, this is data from colleagues who were at UCL at the time, um, the, 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 the probability of release of, uh, of a, a neurotransmitter when an action potential comes down, it can be as low as 20 or 30%. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty strange that you would organize a system, a communication system that seems to be so unreliable. So one of the things is that neurons are usually not connected via a single synaptic connection. So there is more than one. So there's some kind of redundancy built in the circuit. But I mean, it's still, if you look at individual synapses, it doesn't seem to be particularly reliable. So a few years ago, what we did is to develop a really simpli a simplistic computational approach to try to measure uh, how much energy is being spent there in a relatively naive way, I must state, uh, but also how, how much information is flowing and to try to compare these two things. And so obviously, if you want to, if you want this communication to be very effective, you want to maximize the, the release probability. You want a release probability that is close to one. And so you want to have a, a and, and that should maximize information transmission. We measure this uh, using mutual information, by the way. Um, but in fact, if you look at the, at the relation between information transfer and energy consumption, you get a curve that you typically looks like this. Um, and, and which suggests that the optimal energetic design is usually close to uh, or can be close to relatively low probabilities. And so it suggests that this configuration, it can be explained away by an energetic argument. So yes, I mean, it's not, it doesn't seem to be particularly good at reliably transmitting information, but uh, it's, the, it's the biggest, uh, 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 it's the largest amount of bit, it maximizes bits of information per ATP molecule, yeah? Um, that's a good question. Uh, yes, and, and there is also some background noise in the system, which is actually pretty important to get a curve that looks like this. So we assume that, you know, this synapse wants to maximize the information transfer and there's background noise bombarding the postsynaptic neuron. Otherwise you don't get, you actually don't get that. So you, you need to overcome some level of noise in order to get a curve that looks like this. Yeah. But if you would take into account the, uh, the cost of producing the site for the postsynaptic neuron, that could change the configuration. That's true, yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, here we, we, we basically only looked at an individual. Here, 
we actually didn't look into that. That's a very good question. Um, um, we we tried to stick with <laughs> you know what the the firing rates that are that people have reported in vivo in behaving animals, which are usually pretty low. Uh, but yeah, that's that's where we that's where we we got stuck, uh, so to speak. Um, Oh, it's because it comes. Okay, so it. I can draw on the on the blackboard. Sorry. So the if you if you, um, it's pretty simple actually. It's the same. It's the same principle in in most of the data I'm going to show. If you look at um, the energy consumption versus, let's say here, that would be the release probability. It usually depends more or less linearly. Yeah. But if you look at the information transfer, um, it actually as the, it actually looks as a, like a sigmoid. And the reason is because there's, there's only a maximum information in the biological system that you can eventually transmit. And usually you get this peak here because there's some level of noise in the system that you need to overcome. And if you divide a sigmoid by a straight line, you always get a curve that looks like this. Yeah. And it's basically that principle that applies over and over again. Okay, so what can you do with this? Uh, not very much, but there's an interesting prediction. So I mentioned that there, there um, so it depends on the number of contact sites, on the level of redundancy in the network. Um, and you, you get, uh, if you have a, a single contact point, of course you want the release probability to be close to one. And, and it, it the, release the optimal release probability decreases as you increase the number of contact sites. And there's actually one data set in the literature from Ardingham and colleagues where they looked at the, the number of release sites and uh, <coughs> versus the release probability in in vitro, I think, or in, no, sorry, in uh, in uh, brain slices, um, and so we can we can make a try to make a prediction. So this is the basically the experimental data points that we we get from this study, and this would be the theoretical prediction or, or uh, uh, that we have. So I think. We think this is a, a bit of a, a nicer explanation that's trying to fit a straight line through this cloud of points here. Uh, so it suggests that there is maybe something here where uh, depending on the, the level of redundancy in the contacts between any two neurons, this release probability is dynamically adjusted to get to, to, to balance uh, information flow and energy consumption. Um, so this is very theoretical <coughs> and, and we, wanted to, um, we wanted to try to address that in experiments and also in computational model, but to try to have a bit of a more uh, physiological setting. And so what we did is to look at uh, information flow in the visual pathway in rodents, uh, not in the human brain. Uh, but essentially what happens is that um, information goes from the retina to the visual cortex, which is at the back of the brain. Um, and, and we wanna address how this information flow and energy consumption compare at those synapses. And if you look at the circuit, it looks like this. So you have you have um, basically the information coming from the retina and it arrives in the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is sort of a relay station um, and where you have a, a local network and then that, that these, these relay neurons, and that's why they are called like this, they project the information to the visual cortex. And um, this is a, an interesting um, setting because uh, this, M this is mostly a one-to-one -one connection. So these are not synapses that you, like you see in the cortex, which are rather small and, and generate small signals. This is like a massive synapse that generates very strong signals and where you have one action potential coming down here uh, and you have this one-to-one -one feed forward network, so to speak, and then this relay neuron will then generate an output that goes to the visual cortex. Um, and then there is a descending input from the visual cortex that we cheat in the experiments so we get rid of it. And we also block this connection here because we wanna really address uh, uh, what happens along that feed forward pathway at that synapse. And um, I'm gonna just skip some of the technical details, but what we do is to manipulate the intensity of that synapse, so to speak, and to, to try to assess how does this change information flow and energy consumption. And so, as I mentioned just before, uh, when, you, when you change the gain of that synapse, uh, you would expect more action potentials to be propagated forwards to the visual cortex. And the, the energy consumption uh, is basically like a, a, a straight line, sort of. Um, and this is where, so gain one here is the, 
is the physiological gain, and then we applied some multipliers. Um, and, and so gain one is the, the set point of the synapse physiologically. Uh, you can see the energy consumption here, and we, we can manipulate this, and it's more or less linear. And again, uh, as I was drawing here before, uh, this is the information flow. So we normalize this, uh, we normalize this, it's so it's expressed in percentage because we, we wanted to compare different cells or different synapses with each other and they had different basic properties. Uh, but essentially what we measure here is a bits per second using mutual information. And here it's just a ATP per second uh, um, over time. And you can see that we have this kind of sigmoid shape here and, and when you take the ratio uh, cell by cell between, between these two curves, you get a curve that looks like this uh, with a, a clear maximum uh, that is actually very close to the physiological set point for I think most of the cells that we recorded from, not all of them, but for most of the cells. And so it suggests that um, also this synapse is designed as a, a to, to, uh, to maximize the, the ratio between information flow and energy consumption. And, and there is a, so these, uh, these neurons are called relay neurons, uh, but in fact, a lot of action potentials that come from the retina are not propagated further to the visual cortex. And people think that there are some computational advantages to that, uh, but we, we suggest here that there's also an energetic component to it. And of course, this doesn't need to be uh, mutually exclusive. Um, now, if, you, if, you, if there are computational neuroscientists among you and you are interested in that, we actually have a computational model that we calibrated on this experimental data that replicates uh, all of the, all of the uh, uh, main findings of that study that we are happy to share. Uh, and, and you can have a, a much nicer curves. And, the, and you can actually look into um, other things, other you know, subcomponents of that circuit to try to see uh, maybe how, th how this, uh, this would behave. The reason why we developed it is that there was one question we couldn't really resolve experimentally, which relates to these uh, NMDA receptors. So in order to convince ourselves that the experiments were not contaminated by this, uh, we had to uh, reinvestigate the whole thing in a computational model. Um, but then this model can be used to investigate or to ask some interesting questions. Uh, for instance, that synapse, it has an interesting property. It is uh, strongly depressing, so you can see here the currents are inverted uh, by convention, but essentially each one of these pulses is the synaptic current that you would get when you activate these uh, retinal cells. And you can see that in control conditions, you get a very strong response the first time you stimulate that synapse, but the currents that are generated subsequently are much lower, and then there's a, it takes a really long time to recover. And the reason for that is that you basically spend all of your neurotransmitters on this first one, and there's not much left to send signals uh, further down the line. So that's the normal setting of that synapse. But these synapses, they also uh, express uh, uh, receptors for serotonin. And when you modulate the level of serotonin, you can really completely change this dynamic uh, where you get a much smaller signal initially, uh, but they are all more or less equivalent. And the interesting thing is that if you calculate the energy consumption in these two conditions, which is basically the integral below these curves, uh, it's more or less the same. So you just redistribute the currents over time. Um, and so it will change the integration properties of that synapse and maybe the type of information that flows through. Uh, so we started uh, looking into this, um, but we don't have anything really exciting to say about it just yet. Um, okay, so what happens at the next synapse in the visual pathway? I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because um, uh, we, so we did the same thing. So we essentially we ran electrophysiological experiments uh, on this layer four spiny stalet cells. So these are the neurons that actually receive the, imp the, the primary input from the visual cortex. And we also ran multi-compartment uh, neuron simulations. Um, the reviewers didn't like mutual information, so we had to use transfer entropy. But essentially, we, we get uh, exactly the same kind of results. So you get a, a a linear relationship between the gain of these synapses and the energy that is being spent on this information flow. You get a, a, linear, a somewhat linear relationship and you get this really sharp sigmoid curve for information flow. And, and then when you take, ad, take the ratio, you get this really sharp, uh, these sharp curves. And, and gain one here is the range where people think the, the normal physiological strengths of these synapses is, right? 
and, and this has been measured in experiments. And so this is from, this is from multi-compartment uh, neuron simulations, uh, but we also have similar results uh, in experiments. So you see a somewhat linear relationship for the energy consumption. And here it saturates and drops down. But I mean, these are pretty tricky experiments to do. Uh, they, they were actually done by my colleague, uh, Julia Harris. Um, and the data, I must say, this, the, the experimental data that we got is rather messy. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily uh, rely too much on what happens at, at very high gains here, uh, because it's pretty hard to, to really control what happens in the local network and to, to really stimulate these cells properly. But just to, um, just to recap what I said so far, so in the, f in the first part, uh, or in the, in the first data set that I showed you, what we observed is that um, there's a low release probability on the presynaptic side, uh, which is hard to explain from an information processing point of view. But if you add to that the energe an energetic component, um, then we think that you, you can actually explain why between the redundancy in the, in the network connectivity and the energy energetic constraints, we think that uh, this can explain why you get a relatively low release probability. And similarly, if you look at the postsynaptic side, which is really the question that we were addressing in the second data set, in the visual pathway, you have this imperfect action potential transmission at relay synapses. Um, and, and lots of action potentials are not relayed from the retina to the visual cortex. But then we think that this can, again, this can be partially explained as a way to maximize not information transfer, but to maximize uh, information over concomitant energy consumption. So really bits of information per ATP molecule. This doesn't mean that this is the only explanation and that there are not other computational advantages to organizing the system that way. But it's an interesting finding that uh, it kind of magically works when we do these experiments, yes? That's a very good question. We've, I don't believe there is, and we didn't look into it. I mean, the systems that we looked into, I mean, this is really looking at one localized synapse. And these neurons here, as I said, I mean, they, they, have, they don't have a complex structure, oh. these relay neurons. They, they, I mean, they have a few big dendrites, and then there's a huge axon that innervates and makes this kind of mac, mac really mega synapse with almost 200 release sites. So these are very different structures than in the cortex. Um, it's a very good question. I don't think anyone has looked into it, but then I guess it would be pretty complicated to address this, even in simulations, because you would have to be really sure what, you know, that you don't fall into pitfalls because, I mean, what happens in the dendrites is, I think, is not fully established, right? And uh, it's an interesting development for the future, I would think, but I'm not aware that anyone is doing this. Okay. Oh, I'm already. Um, so what one question is, uh, I mean, how does this, um, I mean, it raises a question why, uh, I don't know, every synapse should be organized like this. It, it doesn't necessarily need to be. And also we wanted to go a step further and try to address the question, uh, how does that scale to the network level? And so what we did uh, with my postdoc, Mitro Gritsky, we started looking at networks of, so we, we look at that in a very simple setting. So we look at this a small network of Hoax neurons with uh, reset after spiking. And we are asking a basic, so it's sort of a feed forward network. And we are asking a simple question, which is, uh, can you derive a learning rule that maximize mutual information between inputs and outputs to that network with an additional energy constraint? Uh, so you want to basically maximize mutual information minus this, minus this uh, uh, energetic term. So you you try to keep energy consumption as low as possible. And then you can derive a learning rule as a gradient descent optimizing for this function. And so what we, in a nutshell, uh, what we found, and which I think is really interesting, although if you think about it, it's pretty obvious that it should work that way. But so uh, Dmitro's idea was to present input signals um, with, um, with different uh, frequencies. So you have very frequent inputs, uh, very rare inputs as p uh, input patterns. Um, and then what he does is to, he lets the system run and he applies this learning rule and he looks at the, at the, uh, the output. So if you don't apply, so this is the strength of this, um, 
the strengths of these uh, energetic constraints, which is a, a free parameter here. Um, and so what happens if you let the system run with no energetic constraint is that rare inputs will evoke very weak activity uh, after learning and frequent inputs will evoke a very strong activity. And uh, of course, you understand why this would maximize mutual information between inputs and outputs over time. But if you start to crank up the uh, energetic constraint, what you observe is uh, the quality of inference decreases uh, quite significantly, but you get a complete reversal of, um, of this setting. So now uh, frequent inputs evoke very weak activity. This is what the network has learned and rare inputs evoke very strong activity. So you get with this energetic, applying this energetic constraint and using that learning rule, you, you get a kind of sparse coding uh, for free, or not for free, actually. You lose, you lose, uh, you lose uh, a quality of inference, but you get a sparse coding that emerges uh, spontaneously. And so I think it's a really interesting result. Maybe it's j obvious to everyone, I don't know, but I think <laughs> it's cool. Um, and so it's possible to derive learning rules that are uh, reminiscent of synaptic learning rules observed biologically. And, and, and there are three factor rules in that case. So you get a presynaptic term and a postsynaptic term, which is pretty common in synaptic learning rules. And there's a third global term that sorts of looks like a, some kind of a, a, a adjustment of the overall level of activity in the network. And so if you think about what kind of cells could be responsible for this uh, more monitoring global term, and then I would argue that uh, this could well be these uh, astrocytes here. Uh, as I told you before, uh, they, are, they are responsible for siphoning away the glutamate at synapses, so they have a direct readout of the input to a local network. Uh, and actually, metabolically supporting neurons in an in activity-dependent manner has been one of the functions that have been postulated by astrocytes for a very long time. Uh, so this is actually a, a review from my former boss, Pierre Magistati, uh, these, I must say, <laughs> that's uh, I think what Pierre-Yves Plasse was uh, alluding to yesterday. Um, so what they are claiming, uh, uh, this, is, this is from, they actually did work on this from the, since the 90s. So that they are claiming that astrocytes basically, uh, they can see input to the local network because they collect this glutamate at uh, every synapse. And then this triggers glucose uptake from the circulation to which uh, astrocytes are connected. And there's a shuttling of metabolites uh, that then uh, are used to produce energy for the neuron. And, and so you have this metabolic coupling that is directly related to the presynaptic activity to, to a neuron. Um, and this has been a hotly debated issue in brain energy metabolism, but I think there is accumulating evidence that there is some kind of that happening. So we have this coupling between neurons and glial cells. And so they would be the ideal candidate to, to really uh, monitor what happens at the network level and maybe modulate plasticity. And if you don't believe me, uh, you can, you can, there's actually one uh, nice uh, demonstration of that. Uh, so if you, if you disrupt this kind of connection here, you can uh, impair one-shot learning in, in uh, a specific paradigm. Uh, there's unfortunately not a better figure than that in that paper, to, to, but what they do is that they, they basically dump mice into uh, uh, adverse conditions and they learn basically in one shot that there's a room where they don't want to go because they get an electric shock. And if you disrupt uh, uh, metabolic communication between astrocytes and neurons, you, you basically impair that learning. Um, okay, how am I doing on time? So I spoke for quite some time. Okay, so I hope I convince you that, that there is an interesting link there between energy consumption, uh, information processing, and the cells beyond neurons in, in brain networks. Um, and I just want to then maybe say a few things about uh, how you can, you can maybe use some of these findings for technological development. Uh, and this is one project uh, that I've, I'm really excited about that we, we got uh, together with colleagues. So this is a technology project from the EU. You'll remember that I showed this figure earlier where um, that's the release probability uh, of, uh, of uh, 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 glutamate or of uh, neurotransmitters at synapses that can be very low. There's an interesting property of that is that this release probability is very strongly modulated by the extracellular calcium concentration. Um, and also neuronal excitability is very strongly modulated by the amount of potassium that is in the extracellular space. And, and these guys have a pretty low uh, endogenous concentration in physiological situations. And so there is this idea that maybe if you could modulate 
uh, the concentration of extra extracellular ions um, in one way or the other, you could actually really affect uh, how neural networks communicate to each other. And this is a project that we are doing with uh, IBM Research in Zurich, uh, multi-channel systems, which is a company in Germany and some colleagues in Italy, in the UK, and in Italy, in the UK, actually. But so, and our idea is to develop a, a, pla a new type of platform to interface with brain tissue, uh, where we use nanowire field effect transistors to record from neurons, but we also have a, a electro-actuated polymer that can r release or capture ions um, and, and modulate the extracellular concentration of these ions and really interplay directly with the basic physiology of neurons so that you can, you can really modulate their, their uh, uh, maybe the way they talk to each other or the probability with which they talk to each other, but also the, the, their level of excitability. Um, so it works in theory. So we have, a, if you are interested, there's a, a preprint that we have that we are revising now where we've done all this kind of complex bifurcation analysis to see uh, to what extent we can really modulate uh, neuronal activity in, a, in a, a more or less realistic scenario. The devil is in the details, unfortunately. So the, the electrochemistry that is required for this kind of uh, 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 actuating polymer is pretty complex. Uh, and this is completely out of my area of expertise, I must say. Uh, but I think this is a, we are, we are really trying to go beyond the traditional electrode with the idea that this one day could become um, you know, a new type of, of brain machine interface or a new technology for brain machine interface, let's say. Um, there's another project uh, that we are working on that relates uh, indirectly to these ideas of energy consumption, which is also one of these technology projects from the EU. Um, and it connects because if you, if you, uh, if you know a bit how uh, fMRI or, uh, uh, and, and positron emission tomography work, you will know that what you measure really is the, the energy consumption of the brain as a proxy. So if neurons get activated, they consume a lot of energy, which you can see in bold fMRI and also in positron emission tomography. And I did, uh, I did pass through CERN at some point in my career. So I in inherited this uh, project where we are trying to develop a new kind of uh, imaging technology to, to measure uh, brain activity. Uh, and this is using uh, basically radioactive uh, tracers and, and a, completely, a completely new type of detection that is not only, um, uh, that really doesn't really, re I mean, it relates to existing methods, but is really a, combina a new combination of physics to, to uh, detect uh, brain activity. And that's it, that's what I had to say today. So uh, basically to recap, your brain doesn't consume a lot of energy, but it's a lot for your body. And um, I hope I, 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 I could convince you that there are some interesting questions to address there at the interface between really energy consumption and, and information processing. And you can even you know, convert some of that research into some possibly uh, future technologies. And uh, that's it. Uh, these are our, my team collaborators founding. Thank you for your attention. It's a relatively small net feedforward network, and you just input patterns with different uh, frequencies of uh, 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 exposition, I guess, and, and then you, you uh, basically apply the learning rule. Uh, so it's a synaptic learning rule. So you, you let the system run, and, and you, you, let the, you apply the learning rule uh, after each presentation of a, of a, of a sequence. And then eventually, you know, after some time, you converge to, to uh, a certain configuration of the network and you can look at how much activity is evoked and, and uh, actual, you can measure using neutral information, uh, how much information actually flows through in average in, in that network. Yeah. And so it's a very, I, I must say, it's a bit of a toy scenario, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's not meant to be used in any practical <laughs> case, but I think it's interesting because it shows you that you, you get this sparse coding where essentially if you, which I think is a natural thing if you think about it, that if you, if you are in your natural environment, you don't want your brain to react 
uh, to, to, you know, so, so you, you, will have, you will have bursts of activity when you are presented with something that is unexpected um, in that very simplistic scenario. And then of course it's very, it's very energetically efficient in a way. And if you know, you know, people, re people will record from neurons in vivo in behaving animals. Uh, the, the, the frequency of activity of neurons in vivo in behaving animals is surprisingly low, right? I mean, it can be below one hertz, sometimes 0.1 hertz. It can be extremely low. So neurons don't seem to be uh, often super active in normal, in normal situation. And so in, in a way you get that for free there. So I think there is an interesting, there's an interesting connection. Um, it seems like a natural thing that it would be organized like this, but yeah, that's my bias, obviously. No, but actually we got scooped by uh, Tim Kitzman. I think he has a really cool paper with more or less uh, similar or maybe better results uh, that was just published, I think a week ago maybe, if you, if you look him up. And they did that even in recurrent neural networks where they looked at, at um, and, and they argue that actually the, there is some form of a localized specialization in the network, I think, um, where you have sub networks that appear that perform certain tasks and so th I think that there's, there's a, 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 it's, it's interesting to look at these energetic ca questions in, in that regard. Um, and that you, we, you seem to be getting stuff for free or, or easily that is not always necessarily uh, uh, easy to implement otherwise. My, my interest in there is mostly because I wanted to understand how this idea of uh, optimality at the synaptic level might connect to a more network level. And I'm really interested in trying to understand how these other cell types in the brain play a role in, in, in shaping neural activity or in controlling neural <coughs> activity. And I have an inflammatory statement to make that I think neurons are glorified cables. You know, they, they, they are not, they, this is not where a lot of the computation happens. We will see in 50 years if I'm proven wrong or correct. But uh, Maybe it's just that we should think of neurons as like all these different cells and not just the one that we call neuron now. Oh no, this is, this is getting into dangerous territory. No, neurons are pretty, what is a neuron is pretty well established, right? And, and what these other cells are, are pretty well established as well. Brain networks, call them brain networks. Yeah, we are stuck with neuro as a prefix for everything in neuroscience, unfortunately. But I think we, we need to, so the, I think there are two questions there uh, that you didn't ask maybe, but one is, do we need to understand this for AI or for really effic efficient, you know, AI-like system? I'm not sure, um, maybe not. Uh, but to understand how the brain works, I think we, we need to go beyond this, uh, simplistic vision of the brain as a really big neural network. And, and just, you know, it's 80% of the cells in the cortex. So it seems quite naive that you can ignore 80% of the population of cells in any organ and have a shot at understanding what this organ is doing, right? That's a pretty, it's a pretty narrow view. And, and if you look at the literature on these other cell types, you will find out that and the, it really exploded in the last 10 years. It's a combination of new methods being available to investigate, but also because it's a bit of the far west, you know, there's a, not many, there's a lot of things to discover because they were left a bit behind. And every time people look, you know, they find, uh, they find functions. They, there was actually a really cool paper in Zebrafish where they showed that astrocytes are sort of integrating. So the, the, the Zebrafish is trying to catch a prey and then the, the, this, uh, this uh, astrocytes in Zebrafish are integrating the missed shots at catching that prey and that eventually they shut down the behavior of trying to catch the prey. So again, some kind of a behavioral trade-off between how much resources you invest into something and, and, and when to switch uh, to a different behavior. And so I think if we, uh, if we wanna have a shot at understanding how the brain works, we need to go beyond neural networks. Yeah. 
constraints, you know, related to a different constraint. So, and the fact that you can have multiple connections and the risk of volatility is fantastic, all these kind of things, I mean, uh, suggest, seem to suggest that uh, all this idea of back propagation and so on, trying to reproduce that in the hardware is kind of going to cover what happens in the Yeah, so the clearly the brain was not designed by an engineer who was concerned about uh, a precision and, and you know, reliability and reproducibility, right? And I think, I, do, I don't, uh, I agree. I don't have an answer to that question. I think we don't understand how coding is organized and, and clearly it must rely on some kind of uh, alternate other methods than, than sending signals at a precise time and, and, and relying on, 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 on precise timing, precise amplitude and so on. Yeah. between uh, layering and membrane axon? Oh, it's very small. It's like uh, a few nanometers. So it's yeah. a crude mess. So th I didn't show that, but I mean, the, the, the experimental data we have in that paper that I mentioned at the very beginning, we, we this you can only really see that in electron microscopy data. So my colleagues did all the electron microscopy. So it's between a, f a few nanometers to 10, 15 nanometers, something like that. How can you vary the distance from zero to 20 nanometers? In well, it's a simulation. You can do Sim whatever you want. But I mean, this we, we do see we do see a modulation. Uh, so in in different experimental conditions, we do see a modulation of this uh, distance. And and what I think is pretty interesting is that the diameter of the myelinated axon doesn't change, but it seems that the somehow the myelin is being compressed or expanded. Uh, around the axon to, to reduce or increase the, this uh, kind of empty space. And it seems to be reversible. Uh, there are no signs of, uh, the, there are well identified signs of pathological situations that you can see in electron microscopy data. We didn't uh, observe any of that. So it suggests that this, this is really some kind of uh, physiological plasticity mechanism that can be used to adjust the conduction speed. And I mean, if you think about if you think about how the brain is built, you would want to be able to adjust this conduction speed probably, right? Because you, you might want a signal to reach uh, a certain place at a specific time and it's a complex wiring. So, it's not, it's a, so it makes sense that it should be organized like this. The other type of plasticity that I, I was describing uh, that I mentioned briefly um, uh, and, and what they showed is that, so you, you have, um, you have a purport, you have stem cell life in your in your brain uh, throughout your adult life. It's actually a pretty high proportion of the cells in your brain. Some of them integrate into the network. Some of them die out. And when they integrate, they form new oligodendrocytes. And so this vis this textbook vision of the myelinated axon is pretty inaccurate because it's it's really being continuously reorganized with cells that disappear, new cells that integrate. And, and they have shown pretty convincingly using genetic manipulation that this is actually essential for learning complex motor tasks. So they, they have rodents running into one of these <coughs> wheels where they take some of the bars away. <coughs> right? And it's pretty hard to, because they have to make a different step uh, uh, every time. And there's a pretty, it's pretty convincing paper uh, that this is really essential for learning even in adult age. So this was not done in, in, in the during developmental periods. Cells in cortex uh, glial cells, and what type of glia is oxophytes or microglia? I don't know. Because normally it's one to one. Why well in the whole brain it's one to one, but in the cortex there is a yeah. surrepresentation of glial cells. I don't know. Why well, I don't know, <laughs> but I think I'm just saying that it's probably a bad idea not to look into them. Uh, how this is subdivided, I also don't know, and I don't believe that there is. Uh, clear n there are clear numbers for that because if you look at the purport the numbers that are in the <coughs> literature it's sometimes a bit all over the place in the sense that they didn't in the paper that I showed they didn't try to do any kind of subsequent uh, further classification of uh, different cell types uh, but if you look at what people have reported in, in, in rodents for instance in different parts of the brain you have more microglia fewer microglia and so on so it's probably quite hard to have a exhaustive vision o of that. I don't think the data is there. I don't believe so. Okay. Cool. Thanks again, Henry. Thank you.